Welcome Santos Benacci. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see new faces uh, this evening uh, from uh, uh, the presentation we did, part one, uh, last night. So I'd like to commence with just uh, uh, a brief review of um, the first part of this presentation. This presentation is dealing with the sun. And we're going to put some perspective into this orb of light. From a, an astronomical perspective, from an astrological perspective, an astrotheological perspective, uh, from the biochemical perspective, alchemical, theological, and practical. That's syncretism. And uh, <clears throat> there would there will always be seven complete levels, complete levels of interpretation in every <coughs> sacred text that we have from antiquity. Otherwise, it doesn't qualify to be holy. See, holy comes from the word light. And the sacred texts are dealing with light. God is light. And the magnetic causal light of this universe, we live in a magnetic universe of cause, and an electric universe of effect. And that effect is produced by universal mind knowing. Universe is mind. And these suns that we see, ours in particular was known as Horus. Hence the horizon, Horus rising. And in the Gospels, in the Nag Hammadi Gospels, they call this one Jesus, Jesus. Yes is the sun, fire, the element of fire. Jehovah is the element of fire. It's the tetragrammaton or the tetrahedron. Take your pick. <clears throat> and so this Horus was always, they watched him, and his, um, his opponent was Set, Saturn, at sunset. And Stonehenge has 30 uh, uh, perimeter stones. This is, uh, this is the number of Saturn, Set. <coughs> so, 30 years is the orbit of Saturn. And you see Horus and Set are the key uh, characters and archetypes in all of the theologies. Nursery rhymes, stories, gospels. <clears throat> the gospel is a goat spell. It comes from <clears throat> the Greek word Tragedy, and it's Dragos is the goat. Edi or Dragos Udi. That's an ode, ode to joy, a play, a song, a spell, a comedy, as Dante puts it, an opera as Puccini would put it, a song. <clears throat> Udi is Ode, the song of the goat. The goat is Capricorn. Because Cap Capricorn is the, the sign that is the Masonic sign. See, the sun is born in Capricorn on the 25th of December. He's the carpenter. Carpenters are builders. Builders are mason. The logo of Capricorn is, I use, I build. It's the builder. <coughs> and so it builds songs. You start in Capricorn, because that's where the sun starts. So you just follow the dragos, the tragedy, 
And tragedies, as we know, are always sad, aren't they? They're not just happy and victorious. There's always sadness. Ulysses had to struggle to get back to Penelope. Jesus had enemies. He had a good time, a good part of his ministry. But then, again, but then he was betrayed. The same with every hero. Every hero. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty will always fall off the wall. There will be a tragedy because the goat... See, when you follow, this is the earth, there's the equator, there's the Tropic of Cancer, and there's the tro Tropic of Capricorn. And this is... <clears throat> well, it's Cancer. And there's Capricorn. That's the goat. And it's the bilby, see? It builds the sine wave. If we go around like... See, so here is spring, the start of the year, summer, summer solstice, autumn, equinox, winter solstice. <clears throat> so, but when we swing this around, we begin to see why the, the goat is important. He's the boss of the solstitial axis. It's the earth sign, cardinal earth, ruled by Saturn, lead. That's where you start turning your lead into gold. The story begins here. So every story is alchemical. <laughs> you can rest assured it will, it will always start either on this solstice or where it should predominantly always start in Aries, where the sine wave begins. And as we discussed yesterday, we put the head of the human being here, being here and then the two fish of Pisces are the two feet. And the cerebrum is in Aries, and the cerebellum is in Taurus, and Gemini the arms. So there's the body there, so naturally it would start here, but also naturally it starts here. The tragedy. <clears throat> and also Mars exalts in Capricorn, that's iron. See, so <laughs> this is the solid, and Capricorn <coughs> rules the the bones in the human being. There are 12 systems. There's the skeletal system, the muscular system, cerebrospinal system, lymphatic system, respiratory system, digestive system, heart, circulatory. And so this is the bones. This is the lead, the bottom. And then by the time you get to Jupiter, St. Peter, Jupiter, St. Peter, the last element, the first element is <coughs> Capricorn, the Tragudi, and then of course Jupiter is, well, <laughs> one only needs to uh, study the myths and astrology and all the sciences and one would know what Jupiter stands for. Yes, Jupiter is at the pearly gates because Jupiter is the great, the greater benefic. And... Um, is uh, the Greeks spoke about the three heroes, the three types of heroes, and the Jupiterian hero is the highest, then the Neptunian, and then the Plutonian. And so the Plutonian is the hero that has not yet awakened to the higher mind. <coughs> the uh, Neptunian, like Ulysses, saved himself, couldn't save his friends. But he reached the higher mind. The Jupiterian saves himself and saves others. That's why we have so many saviours and stories about saviours. See, we're not... <clears throat> the Gospels are songs. Nowhere in the Bible does it say this is a true history of a person called Jesus Christ. It tells you it's a Gospel. It's a song. It's a literary character. It's a literary creation. It's the sun on the ecliptic, the storyteller. You can tell the story from an agricultural perspective if you want. So, the sun reaches Aries and it's blossom season. So it must be the start of something, the year. Taurus is the bull, tells you to take the bull out and plough if you're going to harvest in the summer. Gemini is the twins, Dupuis and Volnay say, 
200 years ago, they say this is the sign when, uh, in May when there are twin goats and twin lambs in the spring. Then they tell us that the Egyptians said that the scarab is here and we call it the crab. Cancer, but it's the same thing. Take your pick. Scarab or crab. And then they said the Egyptians that it was a sideways walking animal. So you see, he would have to go sideways. Now he's, he's reached the Tropic of Cancer, there's no, no more. He's gone 23 and a half degrees in latitude. You can't go any more because of the inclination of the earth. And so he's got to go back down again. And this is where, this is where the downhill waning part where the sun falls and dies again to be reborn on the 25th of September and to exult in the Lamb of God when it passes over in the Passover season. So agriculturally the story's there. Biochemically the story's there. Astrologically it's the same story. Astrology is based on this, on these four cardinal points. And I'll be dealing with that extensively in, Brist in uh, Brighton next week and possibly through to London because the astrology stuff that I've got to share on this is extensive. So, so this is why, as I said before, Jesus, yeah, he has a good time. He gets baptised and he goes, around on the, on, he goes around in the Sali baptising his disciples. Well, if you look at, in the Strong's Concordance, it tells you that the circuit of Galilee is the ecliptic of the zodiac. <laughs> they don't, well, they hide it, but in, they hide it in plain sight. <laughs> so Jesus, Jesus, the son on the ecliptic, he gets baptised by January the Baptist, the Baptist month. January, John the Baptist, of course, when he uh, progresses 30 degrees, then he enters the sign of January, and that's Aquarius baptizing the sun, and then he goes off into the wilderness where he spends 40 days to be tempted by Satan. Satan is the ruler of Aquarius. The 40 days are the 40 days of Lent, which are short for lengthening, because the sun is lengthening, and so when it finally reaches the Lamb of God, then it takes the sin away that we were blemished with in the winter. And I did point out that um, of all the Jewish festivities and all the Christian festivities, most of them occur here. The Jewish ones in Tishri, and then there's the... They're all cardinal. 90% of all the remaining holy festivals are in these three signs. And in here, in astrology, this is the sign of the exaltation of the sun. In theology, it's the sign of the resurrection of the sun. Nisan 17. Why have so many outstanding, memorable stories in the Bible all occurred on Nisan 14? Well, because Nisan is Aries, the sign of the rain. Abraham sacrifices, not his son, the ram caught in the thicket. That's Aries. Abraham is the ram, father ram, Abram. Father is in heaven, head. And so, <clears throat> and so in Nisan, on, on the 17th day, the 14th day is the day, basically, that that pinges on this crossing of the sun on March the 21st. Easter is pinned to it. The Jewish sacred year begin, uh, begins on it. And so, and this is what they say is the, the day that Jesus died. Nisan 14. It's also the Ides of March. The other JC died on the same day. That's coming out at the end of this presentation. I'll discuss that. <coughs> But this is, you see, there's always a three-day wait for this crossing and then three days. There's always a three-day, three-day. At the crossings, there's always three days where the sun appears to stand still, then it moves. And it does that at the solstices and equinoxes. It's an illusion. It appears to do this. So the 17th day is a magical day. Because it's, the sun has burst through these cards. The card is a hinge and opens the new seasons. Here is the spring. The primavera, prima meaning first, of course, this is first. 
and then you have summer, fall, and then winter. And you see, but when it passes those four points, it needs three days to then progress and commence that new season. And, and so this is Nisan 17. So Jesus dies on Nisan 14, resurrects on this day. But you know what else happens on this day in the Bible? Pretty much everything. Noah's Ark lands on Mount Ararat on Nisan 17. Jesus resurrects on Nisan 17. The Jews walk through the Red Sea, parted by God, Jehovah, on Nisan 17. They ate the first fruits when the spies, 12 spies entered the land and two came back and brought first fruits. They ate those fruits on Nisan 17. They went into Egypt, down to Egypt went Jacob and his 12 tribes for 430 years of slavery on Nisan 17. They came out of Egypt on Nisan 17. Esther saves the Jews on Nisan 17. Jericho falls, Joshua, on Nisan 17. And they look for Rahab with a red scarlet. <coughs> Aries, it's all Aries. You go to Japan, they've got a festival. I've already covered this. It's called the Festival to Isaac. Misakuchi. Misakuchi means the Festival of Isaac. And they um, have this festival on Mount Moriah. Yeah, that's where the Rome of the the Dome of the Rockies, where Solomon's Temple was built, Moriah, Hill of Mars. And the Japanese are practicing the same thing. I wonder which month that would be. 15th of April, Nisan. Because it's Aries. And then they sacrifice deer, 75, just like they do in the Middle East, in Aries. I've presented the information, it's just magical. Then you go to uh, India and they celebrate on the 15th of April the festival to Sri Rama. The Ram, the High Ram. High Ram was the builder of Solomon's temple. High Ram is up here. So, the reason I've gone into this is to explain that this is the most glorious orb, the king of the ecliptic, the king of right ascension, the sun cannot declinate. All the other planets can, but the sun is always direct on that he is the right ascender, Ra. That's all he can do, right ascend. No declination, because he owns the ecliptic. So these 30 stones, this temple, temple comes from time. Time is Kronos, Kronos is Saturn, Kronos is Set. This is a, the temple of Set. And check out uh, Maria Wheatley's um, information. She took me to a uh, took me to to the Henge the other day, and uh, she um, we we sp spoke about this. She's discovered that this is this is the the ecliptic in in the um, solar system. Stonehenge represents Saturn, and she's discovered this in her book, and so she was delighted to. Um, to see that connection between the 30 stones and Horus. She's discovered that Silbury Hill, that's Earth. And then Stonehenge with its 30 things, that's Saturn. And then she's found in the middle here, Marden, that's the Hill of Mars. Is Miri around, by the way? Or anyone that can verify this, that might be able to help me with the rest of the rings. She's found Jupiters, she's found Venuses, and Mercuries. And Silbury Hill is the Earth, a seven-step pyramid. Seven steps. Hmm. Yeah. We, we discussed that, that yesterday, and, you know, I mean, I could <laughs> spend some time on that. But I just want to go through the slides, then, that we considered, and we, we, let's put the sun into perspective, shall we? Here he is, the Lord of the Ecliptic. Notice that this ecliptic begins on the right side. Probably really where it should, because <laughs> the Earth spins anti-clockwise, so it would be logical that Aries should be there and Pisces should be there. But most maps go that way. There it is. 
So we are following this. There's the uh, cross that depicts the sine wave. That's the sine wave. Walter Russell said the secret of creation is in the wave. There's only one wave, and that's the wave that light makes. And the sun teaches us that. We must follow the sun, Christ Jesus. Because it's literary, literary Jesus. It's light. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. It's the light. There it is. That's the wave. That's the secret of creation in many shapes and forms. Every country has it. It's the perennial wisdom. It's the universal wisdom. It explains universal mind thinking. Thinking is dualistic. This is dualistic. Duality. You see, the churches, they, they, <laughs> they rub it in your face, you know. It's the sun. Our sun has risen. Jesus, the sun, our saviour, has risen. That's Horus on the horizon, rising in Aries. Aries arises. And so the, uh, the cross is just the symbol of light and love. Love has four letters in it. There's four cardinal points. Easter, the star is in the east. <laughs> what are the churches doing? There it is in the Vatican. I explained this yesterday. You can see it online. It's already up, thanks to Torbs. That's, that's the sol solstices and the equinox. The equinox is in the middle. There's the biggest sundial on the planet stolen from the Egyptians from Cairo Ki Ra Julius Caesar took that from the Egyptians because he's telling you my bloodline is now in Rome Rama Roma is Rama the head the head of the world <laughs> they are the boss this is the boss corporation I won't get into that I'd love to but <laughs> I'd love to get into that because that needs to be... I'm saving it for Ireland. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, syncretism and self-determination is coming back. Hallelujah. Yeah, and we are a part of it. That's why we're here. I won't, I won't uh, spend too much time with this. I'm going to flick really quick through these. Look at the sun. Everything's the sun. 12 petals, 16 petals... These are all the Catholic churches. There's the Zodiac in Catholic temples all around the world. I've filmed this myself. The Zodiac. It's all Jesus and his 12 posts. Whoops. Apostles. San Miniato. I was only 10 minutes from there. Didn't get to see it because we were busy. <laughs> we were busy with syncretism in Florence. Yeah. There it is. The Zodiac. It's, it's in the Chinese. It's in Kabbalah. There's Jesus hiding behind the Kabbalistic tree of ten Sephiroth. The beast with seven heads and ten horns. The horns of the Sephiroth. <laughs> the seven of the chakras. There it is, the sun. They hide it in plain sight. There it is, the sun walking on water. So these, this is how far we progressed yesterday. The Lamb of God. Yeah. There's the lion on the ecliptic, the scales, Scorpio, all bringing different seasons. As the sun changes his degree and his day, each degree on the ecliptic, there's 360, is a new light with a different vibration. Hence, people born on that day will differ from people born the next or the day before. There's a different angle of light. Thomas H. Burgoyne explains this when I get down to Brighton and, and commence the, um, <coughs> the presentation on astrology. It will, be, it will be hermetic, biblical, western, tropical astrology. And it will be based on those tropical points. And we'll explain how the, the Egyptians knew that the science began when the sun started at zero point in Aries and then began on the ecliptic, and that was Aries, the start, the beginning, Ra the head, Resh, Rosh, the head. And so um, Thomas H. Burgoyne said that every day on the ecliptic as the sun changes its inclination, that signature vibration of that degree 
is a different angle, a different angel. This is the, the, the language of angels or the science of angles. Or ark. <laughs> you want to know where Noah's ark is? Well, if Noah's ark lands here on Nisan 17, this must be Ararat. Where the Sahas Rara chakra is. Alright? So if and the Bible tells you that Moses was in the ark for 150 days and it rained for, it rained for 150 days. Yes, 150 days is the five months, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, 150 days. And this was called the flood of Noah. This is the flood. Here you have Aquarius, here you have Pisces, here you have Capricorn, winter, rain. This is the flood. When the sun's on the ecliptic in winter, we're saying, oh God, it's Noah going through the flood. And then it lands on Mount Ararat, where Rahab is and the Sered Bran. You see? And this is, this, is, this is the flood of Aquarius. Here is January. <clears throat> See the urn? That's the urn that Aquarius holds because Aquarius is ruled by Saturn. See the urn and Uranus. See the urn? <laughs> it's all here. This is Abraham comes from the land of Ur. That's Saturn or Uranus. Because Abraham is Aries, the ram. Anyway, let's progress. We did that also yesterday. There's the sun gods. It's all the sun. Every hero is the sun. It will always be the sun. Because he is the chief, principal, active agent in the universe which divides the magnetic, still, pure white light. That's why Jesus is born of a virgin. The virgin is indicative of the still magnetic light. Magnetic is Magdalene or Mary, the Virgin. Of course she's a Virgin. That magnetic causal light is pure. It's omniscient. It's omnipresent. It's here on the tip of my finger. finger. And it's everywhere in the universe. It's still magnetic light. And out of that come all the forms of illusion of the electric universe, of duality, vibration, dimension. Time and space. It's a temporal, spatial temple. And that's what Stonehenge is all about, telling you that. Because Kronos is time. It's all about time and the wave. And these are the scriptures we finished here. And we saw scriptures like, <laughs> I mean, it's so blatant. This is only a snippet. Because <coughs> otherwise it, it'd get boring, you know. <laughs> it'd be like having big books that you have to read like this. So I've just chosen a few snippets of the sun glorified in scripture. For the Lord God is a sun. <laughs> when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I was quoting Psalms 83, 18. This is Psalms 84, 11. And I was saying, uh, 83, 18 says, uh, apparently it's, it says that's Jehovah's name, you see. <coughs> where Jehovah's name is. And... Um, <coughs> And so, but here, in the next chapter, <laughs> for the Lord God is a sun. And it doesn't say S-O-N, it says S-U-N. It's a sun. Because Jehovah is yod heh va -he, the tetragrammaton, or the tetrahedron. Just pick your discipline. And you've had, that's for the camera, so I won't, but there's just that one choice snippet. Um, Revelation 12.1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. In Genesis 37, 3-11, Joseph tells his dream of, of the sun, moon, and 11 stars bowing down to him. Psalm 183, 148.3, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all you stars of light. Stars are astros, right? Astro, logi, logi is word. So stars are light. Astro is light. Light is God. And logi means word. It's the word of God. 
Ecclesiastes 11.7, sweet also is the light and good for the eyes to see the sun. This is talking about solar gazing. Yeah, because they used to kiss the sun. The Egyptians always waited for Horus to rise and they would kiss the sun by looking at the sun because they knew that that electrical connection with Father L stimulates the pineal gland. And many people who learn to do solar gazing have many wonderful effects. When I was in Rome, uh, well, we did four days of syncretism in Florence and then two days in Rome, and uh, Marco, who, uh, whom I stayed with, uh, I told him to do solar gazing and, um, before I arrived in Italy, and he did. I told him how to do it. Ten seconds for the first time. When the sun is low, this is below two UVs. So it's, it would be dangerous to do this when the sun is high. When setting or rising, as the Egyptians and the Therapeutae and the Essenes used to do. They used to kiss the sun. And so Marco did this, and he said he didn't sleep for 24 hours because he had that much energy. And he continued on from there. And you see Marco, he's like this. Picked me up at the airport, took me to Florence, and he's, you know, is a sovereign in Rome. They're all sovereigns. Well, you know, we use that word sovereign. We need to reclaim that sovereign. I know that in some people's ears that will sound like, yeah, but a sovereign's not true free because it still has, you know, uh, yeah. anyway, <clears throat> but the point is that uh, sovereignty is dealing with our kingship, which is our right. And we only lose that when we register with the regis and we lose that right. And then we have services, privileges and benefits. So. <coughs> This is the kingly part of our nature, and the priestly part of our nature is also the other part that we are feeding as well, as the lawful, the priestly. They go together. And so, <clears throat> sweet and light and good it is for the eyes to see the sun. So, um, yeah, and um, so Marco had that benefit. Immediately he got energy from it. Other people have dreams and visions the very moment they do it. Other people have uh, more energy. Uh, but all benefit from solar gazing. And I would also recommend, while I'm on this subject, to um, try to walk barefoot on dirt as much as possible. <coughs> dirt or sand. And walk, not just stand, walking. The, the, uh, the act of walking is generating electrical charge, electric energy in the body. And that's all we require. Everything's an effect of electricity. The body works on electricity. It's all electrical, and it needs charge. You see people that start to atrophy and, um, and problems with, um, for instance, uh, muscular problems and nerves where they start to w uh, double, um, walk like this and, and what have you. This is just um, loss of charge, electric charge, because we're walking around with shoes too much. We're not grounding. We need to earth. To be spiritual, you must be earth. We must. We we really do need so much more work walking on dirt, walking on stones. I've had a few opportunities when we went to West Kennet Long Barrow uh, with Maria and uh, Gary and Busty. <clears throat> there was a nice path up there to the hills. Took my shoes off, and it was really good. And I felt the effects. <laughs> Wonderful effects. You feel restored immediately. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at uh, what has ever been said about the sun in history and really endeavour to put the sun back into perspective. Because the churchgoer will um, kill a sun worshipper if they find one. I'll call them a witch. And you see, they weren't even worshipping the sun anyway. <laughs> so they're labelled churchgoers and witches, get killed, and they weren't even worshipping the sun. It's called solar worship because it's worshipping the light behind the effect. We don't worship the effect because we know it's temporal. It's like a, a song, you know. Every song has to end. It has to return to silence. And that's what a gospel is. It comes out. And it does that. It does a positive thing and it does a negative thing. 
It does the Horus thing and it does the Set thing. And so, um, rather, rather than having this, uh, the, uh, the reason for this is division, not syncretism. Syncretism was around it for eons and eons and eons of time in this universe. It's only recently been persecuted by a bunch of corporate thugs, really, pirates. <clears throat> Nag Hammadi, the teachings of Sylvanus, Sylvanus was a great Gnostic, calls the true light and the sun, calls Christ the true light and the sun, S-U-N, of light. Christ, notice the spelling of Christ there, folks. You see, Christ is the hidden one. Christ is this. It's this. All alphabets come from from light. They all come from Christ. Christ is light. It's consciousness. I've done this in presentations, but if you start here with A and you run along here with the English language, whoo, do you get some really interesting things. And you see that A is really what all the Gnostics have ever said is spirit and matter, the two axes, and then joined by the little, see, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is here. Aries, A, Aries, Alpha. The first letter of the alphabet. Even though Alpha means Taurus, the next sign, it's in reference to Aries. And then Beth is in refer reference to, Beth means house, it's in reference to Taurus. And so you'll find that all alphabets do this and M will always be here in the middle. M is the middle, the 13th letter of our alphabet, middle. Next is N, which means the commencement of the negative part. Here is A, the affirmative part, and then N is the negative part. And then what you find here, hiding here, is Q-R-S-T-U. How would you say that? That's Christo. That's Christo. That's the Christ. And it's, and it's there, they've spelt it the correct way. Kira, light, because that's what Kira is, the two Greek letters of the solstices and the middle axis of the equinox. Christ is the glorious intelligence which the Persians called Mithras. His residence is, in, is the sun. That's the Manichaeans. <coughs> Tertullian, you say we worship the sun. So do you. In his apology to the pagans, I, I guess, uh, he, had a, he had a run in, I think, with um, Origen. Was it? Yeah. I think so. Anyway. Uh, Clement, in Excerpta Ex Theodoto, says the Valentinian Gnostics, Gnostic Theodotus, he says the apostles were substituted for the 12 signs of the zodiac. Yes, because they were called 12 posts in, in, in astrology and in theology they are called apostles. Disc eyeballs. Ammonius Saccus, now he's the great one, he's the father or the founder of the Neoplatonic school, hence Plotinus, one of the greatest and most respected of the 2nd century Roman um, Neoplatonic philosophers, 3rd century. Um, and uh, he was so well loved in Rome that he was, um, you know, I think he was also given responsibility with uh, people's um, trusts. He was in charge of many, many rich aristocratic families' trusts. And he was a Neoplatonic philosopher. You can see that even before <coughs> Constantine, there was still, this science was still kicking around. It was only after Constantine and Theodotus that they went down there to Alexandria and snuffed it out proper. But it's still around, and you can see it. It's in there. They're saying it clearly. This is the true, true Christianity coming through. They knew that Christ was the sun, that's light. 
Armonius Saccus taught that Christianity and paganism, when rightly understood, differ in no essential points, but had a common origin, and they are really one and the same religion. This is going to get really boring if you haven't got a left brain analytical, you know, inclination here today. And I'm sorry to put you through this, but this is for the benefit of the cameras more than us today. I know it's warm, <laughs> and, um, but bear with me because it is a treasure of information here. It might be boring and a lot to get through, but it's a treasure. Uh, Irenaeus said the Gnostics truly declared that all the supernatural transactions asserted in the Gospels were counterparts of what took place above, in the sky and heavens, deceptions and myths of the Bible. Emperor Julian, invectives against the Galileans. I've done extensive work on Julian and his two works where he uh, extols the sun. Him to the Son, one of the greatest poems you'll ever read. And he was the emperor. After Constantine brought back the true religion, then they killed him. Julian brought back Gnosticism. Even after Constantine started the corporation here in York, England, when he was enthroned here in York. It was 30 years later, in 63, 363, that he died. And for three years, Rome came back to the true religion and he wrote the most beautiful... And he loved Plotinus, Pythagoras, Plato, Iamblichus. The Romans had a great, great solar worship. They loved Mithras. In fact, it was all Mithras up until Constantine's, Constantine's time. Down in Rome, you can go to worship Isis, Venus, you can worship all of the gods. Because all of the gods are just archetypes, it's just nature. In Christian theology, they're called angels. So they've got their angels, their angles, but they won't let the pagans have theirs. St. Patrick, if he ever existed... Oh, hang on, we've... <laughs> well, <clears throat> um, the reason I say that is because there's so much controversy, isn't there, about St. Patrick? But you can rest assured that it'll be pinned to someone. It always does, retrospectively. <coughs> Uh, Emperor Julian, Invectives Against the Galileans, where he wrote against the Jews and he said this. <clears throat> Within 40 years of the Council of Nicaea, we have the Emperor Julian writing the following. It is, I think, expedient to set forth to all mankind the reasons by which I was convinced that the fabrication of the Galileans is a fiction of men composed by wickedness. Yes, the literal part of it. It was the Julian dynasty that did it, and in particular the Flavians. Uh, Joseph Atwill. Check out the work of Joseph at will and the conspiracy to create Christ. We're going to be dealing with that in a minute, actually. <laughs> that's coming. <laughs> Oops. So that's Emperor Julian and uh, what fine things he tried to achieve in his life. He would stand um, equal with Marcus Aurelius if you have any um, appreciation for what Marcus Aurelius stood for, Antonius Pius and all of that era where, um, where it was said that that was the, the true, the seven or five, the, or the age of gold of Roman period. There were some good periods. Not all is evil. Mm -hmm. uh, not, all, not all is bad. What is bad is good and what is good is bad. You know? <coughs> Same with this country. It's exquisite. We've got Glastonbury. We've got zodiacs everywhere. We've got enlightened people. We've got consciousness here. But, and there's also the banks <laughs> here. Right, So there's the good and then there's the bad. But when we get into unity consciousness, those services will disappear. Sorry. Constantine, Constantine the Emperor Constantine, was born uh, in a place called Nisus, in a Roman town. So it was called Nisus, which is what you were talking about earlier, mm. the Taurus of uh, Vol uh, Vulcans, which I find interesting, you in your comments. That the Vulcans? Yes. Mm. I wonder whether that would be from the Romanian people. Who are the, those, the Thracians? Who are those people? Dacians. That... Dacians. Thracians. Dacians. Dacians. Yes, the Dacians. Okay. The Romans have always held the Dacians with high honour. And um, there's, a, there's a, an interesting um, new uh, documentary out that I've watched part of. talks about how Romania could never possibly have been... Uh, Romanized to such an extent that the whole country speaks a, Ro Roma a Roman language because the Romans were only partially in that country. So it, 
territory of Serbia, yeah. today's Serbia. Yeah. So it's an interesting phenomenon that the Romans help hold the Dacians, these the Romanians, and this is the Balkan area also, isn't it? Yes? Yeah. Uh, and you see the statues of the Dacians that hold the emperors and look after the emperors, and they've got... A, it's pretty much like the Swiss Guard down at the Vatican. They are, they are a special... Um, you know, they have a, a special place in, in society. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the Venerable Mead. We are commanded to observe the full moon of the Paschal month after the vernal equinox, to the end that the sun may first make the day longer than the night, and then the moon may afford the world her full orb of light, inasmuch as first the sun of righteousness, in whose wings is salvation, that is, our Lord Jesus, by the triumph of his resurrection, dispelled all the darkness of death, and so ascending into heaven, filled his church, which is often signified by the name of the moon. That's said enough, I don't need to elaborate. This is syncretism. It's astrotheology. They understood it. I could wish, Leonardo da Vinci, I could wish that I had such power of language as should avail me to censure those who would extol the worship of men above that of the sun. Those who have wished to worship men have made a very grave error, i.e. those who have worshipped a literal Jesus not a literary Jesus. Albertus Magnus, we know that the sign of the Celestial Virgin did come to the horizon at the moment where we have fixed the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. All the mysteries of the incarnation of our Saviour Christ and all the circumstances of his marvellous life from his conception to his ascension are to be traced out in the constellations and are fixed or figured in the stars. As Albert the Great acknowledged, the virgin birth motif is astrotheological, referring to the hour of midnight, December 25th, when the constellation of Virgo rises on the horizon. The assumption of the virgin celebrated in Catholicism on August 15 represents the summer's brightness blotting out Virgo. Mary's nativity, celebrated on September 8th, occurs when the constellation is visible again. Such is what these Christian motifs and holidays refer, represent, as has obviously been known by the more erudite of the Catholic clergy, hence the virgin who will conceive and bring forth in Virgo, and her, is Virgo, and her son is, is the son. Yes, August, see August happens around here. When the sun is here on the ecliptic, Virgo gets blotted out. Hence, on August the 18th, when she gets blotted out, that is the ascension of the Virgin. She's ascended. Can't see her anymore. Then, on the 8th of September, nearly a month after that, the first stars of Virgo appear on the horizon. When you see, when you see her popping out, she is born, and that's the nativity. It all, it's all on the ecliptic. <coughs> Marsilio Ficino, he's the one who translated Hermes in the first place, down in Florence, 500 years ago. <clears throat> the book of the, in the Book of the Sun, chapter 2, how the light of the sun is similar to goodness itself, namely God. <clears throat> Above all, the sun is most able to signify to you God himself. The sun offers you signs. And who would dare to call the sun false? Finally, the invisible things of God, that is to say the angelic spirits, can be most powerfully seen by the intellect through the stars and indeed even eternal things, the virtue and divinity of God can be seen through the Son. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Well, what would that mean? Well, let's have a look. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I made a reference yesterday to how the Son works and I referred to a great... I would call him a genius, Eric Dollard. Has anyone heard of Eric Dollard? He's a scientist. He's pretty good, isn't he? He's, yeah, he's doing Tesla stuff. He's doing every. He's just. He's studied the sun. He says the sun's hollow. When you see a black um, sunspot, you're looking into the sun and that it is hollow. It's cold. It's a transformer or a converter from primary force into secondary force. Primary is the Virgin, the Pia Mater, 
the pure one who does not move, is still, is omniscient, or immortal, um, everywhere. The cause. And that is in the centre of each sun. It's in the centre of each sun. There's always the sun behind the sun. That's why they, that's Ra. That's what they're telling you. That's the symbol for the sun, Ra, in astrology, in astronomy, in all the sciences. That's the sun. Because, see, in the centre is, is a central sun, and that's where the white light comes from. This is dualistic light, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see it. It's electric. That's magnetic in its core. And that's the fulcrum that produces. There's two fulcrums that have zero point in here. And they produce all the effects in the solar system. It comes from the central. The causal point is here. It's a portal. That's why they call them father fountains of light. We come through them, we go back through them. But here is, here is what it's referring to here. When Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is the Father. <laughs> this is the Son, S-O-N-S-U-N. And then Eric Dollard explains that in free space you cannot see the Sun. You can't see stars. You cannot see them. There's no light in space. There's only light when you're in an atmosphere of the Earth. Or should we put the toroidal Van Allen belt and the magnetic shield of the Earth and when the Bible says that our Lord Jehovah is a sun and a shield, it's referring to this. We can only live if we have this. Because if we don't have this protection, the sun's energy will strip away the atmosphere and we die. This atmosphere is the Holy Spirit. This is the Father, this is the Son, this is the Holy Spirit. You only need to read biblical astrologers to understand this. And this is, this is where we live, and we can see from here, as Plato said, our eyes, the fifth, one of the five senses, need a third thing, and that's this. Without this, our eyes are useless. It's a sense that cannot be used, unless we, you know, <laughs> Prometheus comes along. And um, so it, it needs a third thing. That's why it's the Holy Spirit. When you stop breathing this Holy Spirit in the atmosphere, you die. That's why you can't sin against the Holy Spirit. You can sin against the Father and the Son. <laughs> and that's just on one level. Okay, so... <clears throat> I am daily pursuing a new interpretation of Plato. This is um, Marsilio speaking, because of course he also translated Plato. And he was told to stop by Lorenzo de Medici, I think, or Cosimo, and said, get off Plato, get on Hermes. And that's what caused the Renaissance. This, this, this is virtually the, the father, you could say, of the Renaissance. One of the greatest astrologers who ever lived, Marsilio Ficino. Um, I am daily pursuing a new interpretation of Plato. Therefore, therefore, when lately I come to that platonic mystery where he most exquisitely compares the sun to God himself, it seemed right to explain so great a matter somewhat more fully, especially since our Dionysius, the... Our, Areopagite, the first of the Platonists, whose interpretation I hold in my hands, freely embraces a similar comparison of the sun to God. Ficino provides an extensive comparison of God with the sun. In fact, chapter 9 of Ficino's book is entitled, The Sun is the Image of God. Comparisons of the sun to God, in which he remarks, Having diligently considered these things, our divine Plato named the sun, the visible sun of goodness itself. He also thought that the sun was the manifest symbol of God, placed by God himself in this worldly temple. Ficino further states, according to Plato, Socrates called the sun not God himself, but the son of God, because it is the son of God, or Mother Mary, the pure virgin, the mother of God. And this is, this is why the sun is beautiful, but the Father is truth, is good. Jesus says no one is good except the Father. Because good is in, the good is referring to Aries, the heavens, the Father who is in the heavens. Bell is referring to the cerebellum, the bull, the beautiful bull, the holy cow. 
You've got the Lamb of God and the Holy Cow, the two most sacred animals in the head, Aries and Taurus. And El is beautiful but not good. It's only, it's poetry, it's not, it's not judgment. <laughs> Moreover, Dupuy, this is um, Napoleon's, one of Napoleon's crew that went down to Egypt and studied extensively. And what did they come back with? They busted the, Christianity, the Christian modern literalist paradigm forever. Not that it wasn't done. I'm, I've just showed you all the people prior to 300 years, 200 years ago, Dupuy, uh, Napoleon the Great's man, and also... Uh, Volney, Count Volney, these people went across the transatlantic and taught Jefferson and Thomas Paine. That's why Thomas Paine, we'll see his quote in a minute, where he says the, sun's the, the Gospels are just a parody based on the sun in the sky, and the Christians have got it wrong, and they're worshipping an idol, a false white idol, a vicarious saviour. How dare we? How dare we deny our divinity? <laughs> and wait for something vicarious to come along. It's obvious that only a bunch of crafty, crafty priests can concoct something like that. Come on. And you see what they get up to, don't you? They can't hide it anymore. <clears throat> this is the light that they, they, they... Inquisitions are fought to destroy people like this. Dupuy had an entire chapter entitled... And I, by the way, I've, I've contributed in, in my uh, extensive uh, presentations on YouTube, 21 presentations of about three hours each. I've ex uh, presented much of these two, along with God Godfrey Hig Higgins. Um, um, uh, is it Godfrey Higgins? Yes, it is. Um, um, some other great English, the Reverend Robert Taylor from um, Birmingham, 1830s. Uh, Gerald Massey, a lot of great ones came from this country. Uh, and these are, these are French here. But um, he says, When we shall have shown that the pretended history of a God born of a virgin at the winter solstice who resuscitates at Easter or at the equinox of spring after having descended into hell, by the way, he's referring to, in his language, the Latin language, he was half Italian. He would have, if, if he spoke Italian, he would have called hell, inferno, and he would have called winter, inverno. That's the same word. <clears throat> so it's the sun, when it dips down and it goes down into winter, it goes into the infer. Infer is under, under the ecliptic, uh, the um, equator. So, sorry for doing that. Um, after having descended into hell of a god who has 12 apostles in his train, who whose leader has all the attributes of Janus, of a god-conqueror of the prince of darkness, who restores to mankind the dominion of light, and who redeems the evils of nature, is merely a solar fable, like all those which we have analysed. It will be quite as indifferent, or of as little consequence to examine, whether there ever, ever existed a man by the name of Christ, as it would be to in inquire whether some prince was called Hercules. Provide it, provide it will be conclusively demonstrated that the being consecrated by worship under the name of Christ is the Son, and that the marvellous marvellousness of the legend or, or of the same poem has that luminary for its object, because it would seem to be seem then to be proved that the Christians are mere worshippers of the Son. I think I put all the um, intonations in the wrong place and stuff that right up but anyway it's up there <laughs> um, but what he's saying there is it's just a little